If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 25 this morning. We're going to start in verse 29. Actually, we'll start back in 27. This is Genesis 25, verse 27. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter and a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. Isaac, who liked the taste of wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the open country. He was famished. And he said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. This is why he's also called Edom, meaning red. And Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is this birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear it to me. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank, got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. What's well, an interesting story, isn't it? It's an inter- interesting account of what happens in the lives of these two brothers. And what I want us to focus on is is I want us to focus on Esau. I know our series is focusing on Jacob, but I don't want to focus on Jacob this morning. I want us to focus on really Esau and his response. There's some questionable stuff that goes on with Jacob anyways. I I don't really know how how to define a lot that goes on here, but we'll leave it with you to figure out on your own. But I want us to look at Esau. Because if you're looking at at this text and this text only, what we what we start off with is this reality that Esau and Jacob were very different. We talked about that last week. Matter of fact, we read verse 27 and 28 last week. That was part of last week's text. But we came to 29 and we we are experiencing now the account of the lentil stew. This idea that Jacob has cooked a meal and Esau is famished. And when I look at this account of these two individuals' lives, what I realize is the central message that's going on here is that Esau is selling his tomorrow for a better today. He is selling the future so that his life today can be better. That's what he's doing. He has a birthright, and this birthright gave him extreme privilege, extreme opportunity, and it gave him wealth. There, there's a natural portion that he's going to get more money when, when daddy dies, but he's also now placed in charge of all that his father owns. He, he is the head honcho, if you will. Daddy speaks, and people do things, but Esau speaks, and people do things. He would also probably be looked at as like a high priestly figure for the family. Remember that we're in the time of the patriarchs, and the firstborn son would have been learning to be the representation to the people to God. So he would have had this position of extreme honor, extreme control. But you notice what he does. He sells it all away. And he says, I would rather have a bowl of soup than I would to have all that. Now, when we're we're looking at this, there, there's some there's some things that are going on that we probably could give Esau a little credit for. First off, how hungry is Esau? Famished. Boy, have you ever been famished? I like to think I have, but let's be honest. I got a lot that would take before I could be famished. I look at Esau and he's coming in and it says that he is famished. I don't know how long he's been hunting, but here's my next question. How good of a hunter are you if you're famished? Mike, I'm not a really good hunter, but I've managed to take at least something so I could eat if I needed to. And if my life depended on it, you better believe I could find something to eat. If it were wild berries, I'd probably even try them. I don't know what would be good to eat. But if I were that hungry... I would think that I could find a way to catch me something. So I'm looking, I'm saying, we're we're told here that he's a hunter. So I have to question, is he really that skillful if he can't get enough food to survive on? He's at the point right now where he says if that this birthright is of no value because I'm going to die. 
Now that's either, that's two ways. Either first off, he's being serious. First off, he says, look, if I don't get something in me, I'm going to die. And in that case, he looks like a shriveled up person. He has expended all of his body, all of his body weight has been used for energy. So he's a skin and bones. Or two, he's being dramatic. Surely Bible characters aren't dramatic, are they? I mean, come on. These, these people are not dramatic. You ever have a teenager come in and they say, I am starving. I'm famished. Have you ever done it? Oh, I'm so hungry if I don't eat something right away. Now, some of you are like, I'm diabetic, Josh. I need to, I, that's a different story. But I understand, we, we have a guy that walks in and I have a few things as, as either A, you know, maybe he's being serious or B, he's being dramatic. I'm going to probably vote that he's being a little dramatic here. I don't think he's walking in and being like, if he's, if he's so hungry, Miss Betty, that he can't make it in, how's he making it in? Obviously, something a little, little unique's going on here. But anyways, he, he goes in, and then the, the next part that catches my attention is that Jacob, what does Jacob do? Oh, he says, sell me your birthright. Now, like I said, this birthright comes with extreme privilege, extreme opportunity. There's, there's money involved here. So, so the way that the estate would be divided, so you understand, if, um, if Isaac had a million dollars when he died, the estate would be divided three ways. Two shares of that would go to the oldest son or whoever holds that birthright, and the third share would go then to the other child. So there's, extre- there's, there's a lot of wealth here. And by the way, Isaac's not a poor guy from a poor family. He's rich. He's got money himself. But more than just the estate, we have also the birthright, the promise of Abraham, the blessing of Abraham. And so when Esau comes in, he says, give me this suit. Jacob plays this, I'm going to call it a conniving role, where he says, sell me your birthright for this bowl of soup. Now, if if someone offered you the best bowl. I don't know, what's your favorite soup? Anyone like potato soup? Lobster or bisque? Anyone like lobster bisque? Okay, there we go. I got some lobster bisque, folks. Someone offers you the best lobster bisque bowl of soup. What's it worth to you? Is it worth 20 bucks? Maybe you're one of those high class places and a lobster bowl is like $50. You know, you're one of those high class places. Is it worth a portion of the entire estate that your father's going to leave you? And is it worth the promise and the blessing of God? What's your natural response? Just give it to me. No, everyone would say that. That's a ridiculous offer. Jacob, that is absolutely asinine that you would even offer that. And what's even crazier? Esau said yes. Friends, the worst part of this story, as much as I want to blame Esau, as much as I want to, as much as I want to blame Jacob and say, Jacob, you're some sort of like snake in the grass here. I have to look at Jacob at, at, at Esau and realize he's the one who did this. His natural reaction should have been, are you crazy? I might die, but I'm not going to give this up. This is worth far more than that bowl of soup. And matter of fact, I, I talked about how powerful he is. You know, I mean, he's got charge of servants. He's got people that work with him. He snaps a finger and things can happen. Why didn't that occur to him in the middle of this moment? Boy, I do a lot of things when I'm hungry, right, Helen? Well, a lot of things that I wouldn't normally do that all of a sudden seem appealing when I'm hungry. You see, what I realize in Esau is that Esau allowed his feelings to dictate his actions. He allowed his stomach, in his case, to dictate his actions. Now, here's a lesson that I think we learn in this story. Yeah, Mike. Well, here, here's the point. And you got to look at the very last verse there, Mike, because you're right on. The last verse says he despised the birthright. 
he despised the promise of God. That's what this comes down to, Mike, and you're right on. You're, you're jumping, you're about two lines ahead of me in my own notes, so that's okay. But what we see here is that Esau is looking at the future and he says, there is no future that I really want. I want to live my future today. I'm going to sell out my future. I'm going to sell out tomorrow so that I can enjoy it today. I want to do whatever it takes so that I don't have to worry about tomorrow. And oh, by the way, I'm going to despise the promise and the blessings of God so that I can live today with a bowl of soup. I don't care what lobster bisque is. I'm not a big lobster bisque fan, but that's okay. I don't really care what the best bowl of soup is in all the world. It is not worth an iota of the promise that God has given to him. But what does he do? He looks at the promise of God. He sees what God has placed in front of him. And he says, that is trash to me right now. I don't want the responsibility. I don't want it. I don't want anything that comes with being in charge of what God has put me here to do. I would much rather eat a bowl of this soup right now than I would to take responsibility and do what I should do. I want to eat this bowl of soup instead of doing what's right. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but that story hits close to my home. How often do we sell out today or do we sell out tomorrow for today? I look at the future and I say, well, this is, this is, I, I would rather do this today than I would to enjoy that tomorrow. How often do we fall into that case? I'm going to use a couple of examples and I want to step on toes, but I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I am preaching to myself right now. So if you happen to live in Josh Watkins's body, then you're, it's a weird place to be, I'm sure. But if you happen to be there, then this sermon is for you. If you're not, if you've got all this under control, then God's blessings to you, rich strength and power and all that other good stuff. But if you're like me, I'm going to go through a couple of examples. And these are just some examples that I think of for me. I wrote the first thing down, eating out and fast food. Eating out and fast food. You're going to say, wait a second, Josh. Where in the world does eating out and fast food have anything a moral compass to do with our life? Well, let me tell you this. I'm really guilty of driving through the Taco Bell line. It's a Brian brand, I know. Get a couple of tacos, and I eat while I drive. Real guilty of running through the McDonald's line, and as the McDonald's line, getting a burger and driving on. I'm real guilty of going down to Olive Garden, Red Lobster, uh, Port of Arda, and eating some food. And by the way, I like all those places. Do you? And I realize that when I do that, what is the point then of me eating? Oftentimes, eating becomes more of a thing that I just got to do really quickly. But wasn't a meal designed so that I would be with my family and so that I would be with friends and so that I could? be with other people. There's this part of a food of a meal that is sustenance. My body needs something. But isn't part of the meal about being together with people? And when I trade that off, when I sell that off for a quick, convenient meal, I've lost out on the true blessing of the meal. Now let's go another route with that same idea. How healthy is it to eat out? Well, I don't know, I seem to do it a lot. I seem to be not the greatest of health. I know some people who would cook at home. Some of you have some mighty good recipes at home. I always say that there's a why in the world would I go out when I got the best cook in the nation right in my own home. But I look at what I sell, and then and here's my third example with just going out to eat and stuff. Ash and I factored it up the other day. We spent over $600 going out to eat last month. I had like a heart palpitation when we figured it. I had to sit myself down. I had to say, oh my goodness, $600. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of groceries. Now look, groceries have gone up too, but 
but not, not that much. And so let me put it to you this way. What am I selling today? Or what am I selling that is my future so that I can do that today? I'm not saying I'm not going to preach against going out to eat fast food. If you and that's what you do, that's you. I mean, you do you. It's not a sin for you to eat a cheeseburger. Eat a cheeseburger. It's a sin for me to eat a cheeseburger. And you know why it's a sin? Look at this. It's a sin. So the things that I struggle with are different. But when I look at this, I see a gluttonous attitude. I see a gluttonous attitude in Esau. You want to know another thing that I think fits into this? Teenagers, and here, here we're going to go with the teenagers for a moment. Sex. Oh, it seems that when we're 16 years old, that's the new topic. That it's like, oh, well, you have to lose your virginity by the time you're 16, or you're some sort of a dweeb. You're not really counted on in society then. And so what begins to happen by world standards? Well, you got to do this if you really want to count for anything. If you want to be cool, this is what you do. And so then we start this lifestyle habit where we'll see people who jump from sexual partner to sexual partner to sexual partner, all for what goal? For those of you who are married and those of us who even understand, we understand that sex within marriage is a beautiful thing. It is something that is designed to bring people closer together. It is something that God instituted for a husband and a wife. And in those realms, it is wonderful. But when we sell out the future for my present joy, we're doing what Esau did. Statistically, and by the way, if you want to look this up, you can. Statistically, people who have sex before marriage have a higher, have a higher rate of divorce, have less satisfying uh, marriages overall. There are a lot of statistical data that goes with that. Let me give you another example. Working out. How many of you work out? Don't raise your hands. I don't want you to incriminate yourself. Here's another one that Josh Watkins is guilty of. I know that working out, if I work out a little bit today, it's going to make for a better tomorrow. But you know what? How much did I work out this morning? How much did I work out this last week? Every one of you know, if you walked 30 minutes a day, if that's all you did, if you got up and you walked 30 minutes a day, that that drastically changes your life. We all know that, don't we? It's all up here. But why doesn't it go from up here to here? Another example that I would give you is credit cards. Oh boy, I like a good credit card. The shinier, the better. If they got good rewards, I like it even more. Boy, if I can get a good reward point, I can get free trips. Oh, the dumbest thing Ash and I ever did. We were traveling before. This was, were we dating? Then? I don't even remember. We were at DFW Airport and we flew, we flew a lot when we were dating and early married. Worst thing we ever did, Lyle, you know what it was? An airline, American Airlines person was staying there. If you sign up for this credit card, you get free check bags. Oh, that's going to save us like 50 bucks a month on, on, on check bag fees. We flew all the time. And it's like, that's going to save us money. Oh, uh, they've made it back. The worst, though, is I've given you a lot of examples in your own life, in my life at least, that could very easily represent you. But the greatest problem really is sin itself. You see, when I choose to do something wrong today, I'm selling out tomorrow. I'm taking whatever joy God has provided and I'm taking it for today and I'm saying, you know what? I would much rather live in the present today and ignore what God has in store for me tomorrow. The idea of heaven, I don't even care about because my present sin is more tempting, more enticing, more pleasurable, more whatever to me than the joy that God could give me in eternity. And so what Esau does when he comes to this bowl of soup, it's more than just a bowl of soup. It's more than a credit card. It's more than going out. It's more than exercise. It's more than sex. It's more than all of that. When, when he comes to this bowl of soup, what he is saying is he's looking to God and he's saying, God, the blessings that you have for me, the things that you want to give me, the ways you want to take care of me do not matter. I would much rather eat this bowl of soup. And friends, we do the same thing in our own lives. I don't know in what way you sell out your future for today. 
but I know that's not new to us. I know that has been around for a long time. If you go forward to the Exodus story, when they're in, e when they're, they've left Egypt, they're wandering in the wilderness, and then they come to this point where they say, oh, Moses, why did you bring us out here? We should just go back to be slaves when God had a promised land waiting for them. And they're wanting to go back. Malachi, the whole book of Malachi is written from the perspective that we as people are consumers, that we are nothing but gluttonous individuals who want, 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 want. And because of our gluttony, we are robbing God of the blessing that we can give to him. And in return, we are robbing ourselves of his faithfulness. We're robbing ourselves of any joy that he can have in our life. So you know what I have found in my own life, and I'm going to give this to you. This is the answer to impulsiveness. I have found that in times when I'm impulsive, when I just make random decisions, you know why I do that? You know why I go through Taco Bell? Can anyone guess? It's easy, convenient. I didn't pack a lunch. Oh, man, if I pack a lunch, Taco Bell is no temptation. I admire that about Mike. Mike does that every day. You see him come down with his lunchbox. He sits down, he pulls his stuff out. I don't know if Michelle makes it for you or not, but he pulls his stuff out. He got a whole spread of food. He has a nice lunch. Every day I see that man eat lunch. And I'm the doofus that goes down and gives someone else my money. If I plan though, I don't make impulsive decisions. If I know ahead of time, if, if I know that I need, you know, $1,000 to fix my car, because my car is going to need, and I can plan for that, and I have a good plan for it, guess what the credit card does? They don't make their money off that credit card no more because I had a plan. I knew what I was going to do before I needed it. You know what? If I was a teenager and I had a plan before I got in the back seat of a car, A, I probably wouldn't be in the back seat of a car, but B, I would also know that if I were in the back seat of a car, I'd have a plan of what I'm going to do to get out of that back seat of the car without being ashamed. If I had a plan for the next time Satan came to me and said, Josh, doesn't that look good? If I knew, if I had a plan for that already placed right here and I could be prepared, I'm going to know what to do. So friends, when we're impulsive, whoop, there's a thing there. When we're impulsive, we are doing nothing but selling out our future for today. And I think the secret to that is to have a plan. If, see, if, if Esau had shown up and this day had had a plan, if he had a little sack lunch with him, and if he knew that Esau was a, or that Jacob was a conniving little jerk, do you think he would have shown up and been unprepared? If he knew that his, and by the way, he knew his brother was that way. That's not the first time that Jacob got one over on Esau. He's done it before. But if Esau showed up, and he said, man, I'm starving. And Jacob says, well, I cost you your birthright. If he had had a plan, how things would have been different. Friends, we might not be children of Jacob. The, gene the genealogy of Jesus might not have said Jacob. It might have said Esau. Here's my point. Do you have a plan? And I'm not talking about going out to eat after church. I got that plan too. We're going to some burger place. So yes, I'm going to have a cheeseburger. Maybe I'll get a salad with it though. I'll feel better if I have a salad with it. Do you have a plan? Do you have a plan for your life? We're going to leave this building today. Lord willing, he doesn't come first. If he does, I'm happy. My plans will yield to his plans. We're going to leave this building today, though. And when we walk out the doors, we're going to be in a world who does not have a plan for their life. Oh, they, they have a plan, by the way. But their plan is this. It's whatever I want, however I want it, whenever I want it, I'm going to get it. What's the Burger King phrase? Have it your way. That's life. That's the way most people live. And we know what happens to people who have it your way. And I'm not even talking about the end of time. We know that that life is a miserable life. But if you can have a plan and you can put that plan to place, it's amazing how God will bless it. I had a verse that I wanted to share on the screen, but I obviously our screen problem is keeping me from doing that. But 
Proverbs 16, verse 3. Commit your work to the Lord and your plans, he will establish your plans. So I think of us. Have a plan for your life, for this life. But if you put the right plan in place for this life, you're going to put a plan in place for that life too. And if your plan in place for this life is to be a follower of Jesus, that's what we're here for. As a community of people, we want to be followers of Jesus, wholly devoted, dedicated to him. That's our mission. That's our purpose. That's who we are. That's why I get out of bed in the morning, because I love Jesus. And if I love him today, if that's my plan today, do you know what my plan's going to be in the future? Because someday this body ain't going to work no more. Someday this heart's going to stop. I ain't going to breathe. I'm going to be like Rover. I'll be dead all over. And when that time comes, I need a plan. God already took care of the plan for you, by the way. If you're, if you're concerned, if you say, man, I haven't put enough, I haven't put enough treasure in my spiritual, I don't have enough, uh, what's the, jewels in, jewels in my crown. I haven't done it yet. Don't worry about it. Jesus has taken care of that. The question is, is will you make him your plan? Mason has our application prayer this morning. I'm going to invite Mason up as he prays for us. Praise for you, praise for me. That our impulsiveness would stop, that we would know where our weaknesses are, that God would show us the sins that we have, and that He would be with us through His Spirit to empower us to get out of those things. Mason. If you guys would please pray with me. Dear God, um, please let us keep Josh's message um, in our mind, and um, don't let us sell out tomorrow to have a more comfortable today, um, and let us make plans to be with you um, in our life, and to help uh, not only be with you ourselves, but to help others come to you, um, and let us act on that in our life as we go about it, and in your son's name we pray, amen.